Now get this stat, 12% of boys aged between five and seven are now enrolled in the NDIS. Uh, now I don't wanna, I'm not picking on people with autism. I'm not saying no one with autism should be on the NDIS. Clearly there's different spectrums and seriousnesses of, of disabilities like this. I'm Tom Switzer, I'm the Executive Director here at CIS. I think it is fair to say that the Australian economy is doing a lot better than most economists had the right to expect uh, a year ago. Um, growth to be sure is sluggish, but of course unemployment remains near half century lows. The government, thanks to our uh, fossil fuel sector, uh, gas and coal exports and iron ore exports, uh, they're expecting a second budget surplus in May. And even the national debt increase, as my colleague Robert Carling has pointed out in a CIS paper, that has been much less than was projected at the height of the lockdowns. And the good news has also fueled, at least until this week, a stock market uh, rally. And as far as inflation is concerned, the consensus is emerging that if anything, inflation is coming down and that'll put uh, more uh, pressure on the RBA to start cutting rates. So barring an unforeseen shock, the economic signs, and this is what the Labor government will tell you, they do appear reassuring. However, and this is one of our big issues at CIS, if you probe deeper, uh, things look disturbing. And it's not just that many Australians continue to experience a fall in living standards, or that inflation remains higher here than most of the OECD countries. Our dire outlook has more to do with two things, our productivity drought and, and this is important for today's talk, runaway government spending projects. Now the consequences, as we've argued, are being masked for now by the rebound from the pandemic, high immigration and a federal tax revenue boom. But when these pass, we will see a return to budget deficits and stagnation or a decline in living standards. So to address all this, we're delighted to be joined by uh, John Keogh. John Keogh is no stranger uh, to CIS. He spoke at our annual concilium a couple of years ago. John's the economics editor at the Financial Review based in Canberra. He's a former Washington correspondent also for the Fin Review. He's also served time working in the Department of Treasury. Please welcome John. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much for having me here this morning, Tom, and to the CIS. Um, really happy to be here and really enjoyed being at Concilium a couple of years ago too. Uh, I wanted to use this sort of allotted time to really delve into uh, the scope and size of government and government spending uh, with a bit of a particular focus on NDIS, but not exclusively. Um, I actually had to laugh at the front page of the City Morning Herald last week with due respect to my, uh, my colleagues at Nine because there was this story there saying that essentially there were the Labor government ministers, most of them anonymous, complaining that uh, the Treasury and the Finance Departments weren't allowing them to get their great spending ideas up for the upcoming May 14 federal budget. And oh, oh, I'm sure they had lots of great spending ideas out there, um, but apparently Treasury and Finance were being very tough, very tough on curtailing these spending requests. But then. I had to laugh because if you read the subsequent story in the Financial Review a couple of days later by my colleague Michael Reid, he pointed out that uh, government spending and taxation was already hovering around record levels as a percentage of GDP. So I thought about, well, it's just as well there's at least some semblance of restraint going on behind the scenes in the Expenditure Review Committee because if we're already at sort of record levels, we certainly don't want to be pushing the envelope any further. Um, look, th I think the scope and size of government it has gotten out of control. It, it's not just the last couple of years of this government. It's, been, it's sort of slowly crept up on us, actually during the pandemic, really. And it's not so much the temporary stimulus spending that we had, although there was, particularly with the benefit of hindsight, there was a lot of waste, there was overstimulus, and that's why we've essentially got an inflation problem around the world. Uh, we spent, depending how you measure it, federal, state, somewhere three to four to five hundred billion dollars. Uh, fortunately, the economy's rebounded. So as a percentage of GDP, Robert's pointed this out, 
it's maybe not as alarming, but still that's a lot of opportunity cost. That's a lot of money spent that we could have been investing in other things like reforming the tax system or investing in other things, lowering our debt levels as well. But the thing that's probably more concerning, because that temporary stimulus spending has now largely washed out of the, the budget, although it's still hanging around in inflation and too much demand in the economy relative to supplies, it's the permanent structural spending that's now baked in uh, to federal and state government budgets. This is perennial recurrent spending that happens year on year. Uh, and if you look at federal government payments, uh, which is sort of a quasi form of spending, about 26% of GDP. And if you compare that to the last few years of the Howard government, they're at about 23 to 24% of GDP. So the size of government since then has grown by roughly about 2 to 3% of GDP. And just to put that in some sort of perspective, in real terms, adjusting for inflation, that's roughly somewhere around 50 to $75 billion a year in extra spending, even discounting for inflation over that period. And the reality is it might actually be worse than that for a couple of reasons. First of all, we're in a cyclical boom at the moment, so we've got very low unemployment. That means we're spending less on welfare than what we might normally be if the, if the unemployment rate and the economy was ru running at a probably normal sort of pace. So actually, structural spending might be higher. Uh, and I'm focusing largely today on the federal government, but there's also the states, and there's a couple of states in particular who have got really concerning budget trends. Victoria being by far and away the biggest, they're on track to go to $250 billion worth of gross debt. We've got an election coming up in Queensland. No doubt there's going to be some um, probably undisciplined spending proposals there as well. I think the new New South Wales government, um, things are probably a bit better here. They, the new Treasurer, Daniel Mookie, at least seems committed to getting uh, the fiscal um, situation a bit under control uh, after, uh, frankly, I think um, the previous treasurer towards the end uh, in the former Liberal government probably got a little bit punch drunk trying to spend on a whole lot of things uh, on their way out. Paul Keating told the Financial Review in a, a series to mark his 80th birthday a couple of weeks ago in a, a terrific series by my editor-in-chief, Michael Stutchbury, that there's no discipline anymore in government spending and modern politics. And I think he's dead right. Um, if you look back at the Keating era, when he was treasurer and Peter Walsh was the finance minister, they were, and this is un quite unbelievable in today's sort of contemporary terms, they were able to cut 5% of GDP out of government spending a year. It was phased in over five years. So just to put that in perspective, uh, that's more than $100 billion a year today in real terms taken out of, of recurrent spending in the budget every year. And they got spending back below 23% of GDP. And now, I think about that today, it's sort of hard to imagine any Liberal or Labor Treasurer, Finance Minister doing anything like that, even maybe lopping a percentage point or two off spending as a percentage of GDP, let alone five percentage points. So why is spending out of control? I think there's a few reasons, and I'll steal a phrase that Tom's been fond of using in the last few years. Uh, I think COVID brought out the magic money tree. Uh, you know, printing money, we can just spend our way. There was all this modern monetary theory around as well, obviously. And because we weren't feeling the consequences of that. Inflation was low pre-pandemic, and even during the early phase of the pandemic too. We never really sort of felt the negative side effects of overall spending because it didn't hit inflation. Well, that's now turning around. And ironically, actually, this sort of built up in structural spending in the budget, while it's sort of continuing, it actually began under the Liberals, particularly in the last term or so of government. Now, in fairness, a couple of programs that did get out of control, particularly the NDIS, they did genuinely try to make some savings there, and I'll get into that a bit more. Um, but Labor blocked them at every turn as well. There's a couple of big reasons why, in terms of line items in the budget, that we have got spending now out of whack. Uh, the number one reason, obviously, is the National Indi uh, Disability Insurance Scheme. We're spending roughly about $80 billion a year on disability support. It's known uh, in the OECD as, um, sorry, I'll just pause there for a second. Spending $80 billion a year, 3% of GDP, and that includes NDIS, Disability Support Pension, and the carers payment. So it's not all NDIS, but that's up there 
right up near the top. Now, you know, on one hand, it's good we're a wealthy, rich country that we can be affording to look after people with disability. But on the other hand, um, it does appear that we're on track to surpass sort of the European welfare states of Iceland and Finland and be right up the top of spending on disability. The number two reason that spending's starting to get a little bit out of control as well is aged care. Uh, and to be frank, you know, we've got an ageing population uh, we've had an aged care royal commission that shows some shortcomings in the aged care system and the pressure is going to be on to spend more in that sector. We had Jim Chalmers at the Financial Review Business Summit this week say aged care spending is going to go from the number of five or six item in the budget in terms of total spend to number two. It was encouraging at least the last couple of days the government's making some small steps um, moving towards a little bit more of a user pay system in aged care, which I fundamentally believe that's the system we need to be moving to because uh, we can't always just load up more on the taxpayer. So I think they probably could be doing more. It seems like they've largely left the home, the principal place of residence, out of having to use that more, tap into that equity to pay for yourself uh, insurance in aged care. But uh, they're making some small inroads. But I would just say there is actually quite a bit of wealth out there amongst um, the sort of baby boomer, maybe a little bit older, done quite well out of the stock market, the housing boom in the last few years, uh, and even future generations, you know, mine and younger. I think probably we should be more self-funding our own aged care. We can't always call on the taxpayer because that's the younger working age taxpayers. That's going to impose more of an intergenerational cost on those people as well. It would also just briefly re be remiss of me not to mention the disastrous GST deal for Western Australia, which is adding about $5 billion of cost a year. This was a deal struck by Matthias Cormann as finance minister and Scott Morris Morrison as treasurer to basically top up WA's GST payments because of a perception that they weren't getting a fair share. Now, I don't have time to go into all the reasons why the WA argument, it seems plausible in uh, when they say we're only getting 30 cents in the dollar but if you understand anything about federal financial relations um, horizontal fiscal equalization it's I wrote an article in a, a couple of weeks ago in the Fin Review about this it quickly fills down and that deal could now cost 50 billion dollars over a decade so nothing like the cost blowouts we're seeing on the NDIS but still worth mentioning as well now I just wanted to delve a bit deeper into the NDIS with some examples but also some numbers and I want to be upfront, okay? Look, back in 2012, I wrote in favour of the NDIS, let's give the disabled a fair go was the title of my piece. And I think if there's anything the government should be in the first line of business of doing in, in Australia, it is things like protecting people with a serious disability and helping their carers, often who are born into these circumstances through no fault of their own or a tragic accident. So let's get that on the table up front. I think that is a very core responsibility of government, along with things like defence, um, law and order, these sorts of things as well. But back then, the scheme was expected to cost about $13 billion at maturity. Today, this year, this fiscal year, it's forecast to be $42 billion, and we know it's already running over budget for that. Bill Shorten's not telling us the exact figure yet, but we'll find out in the May budget. More alarmingly, the government actuary says by the early 2030s, they could blow out to $125 billion a year. So you can see there's just some enormous growth there. And I think it's fair to say the NDIS has just gone well beyond the original intent and it really has no spending guardrails. Now, half of the 631,000 NDIS participants now have autism, developmental delays or psycho, uh, psychosocial disability. People with autism and development delays account for 70% of new entrants uh, in 22-23 fiscal year. Now get this stat, 12% of boys aged between five and seven are now enrolled in the NDIS. Uh, now I don't wanna, I'm not picking on people with autism, I'm not saying no one with autism should be on the NDIS, clearly there's different spectrums and seriousnesses of, of disabilities like this, but when you ra rack up some of those stats, it does seem like uh, the line has been well and truly crossed. Um, and just to put this in perspective, because I think it does help to use real dollar numbers, just to give people a sense of how much is being spent on participants, on average an autistic NDIS, NDIS participant receives about $41,000 in funding a year. and 
the children age up to 14 in that um, category receive an average of about $20,000 a year in funding. Um, and the states have also cost shifted a lot of the NDIS from about a 50-50 share originally. Now the feds are expected to cover more than 70% of the NDIS by 2026. So there's, there's a lot of problems. I thought it'd be useful to share with you just a few anecdotes and examples. Um, I've written quite a bit about the NDIS over the years. I do get a lot of reader feedback, not all of it positive. You know, some people really pushing back about what I've written, but also um, quite a bit of support and anecdotes and stories from people who see firsthand. So just let me share with you these. Um, the first example, Glenn Doolan from Queensland. Glenn wrote to me a few weeks ago. He said, the NDIS system no doubt assists some people who desperately need it. But on the other hand, it is also facilitating massive rorting by those who need it the least. A friend of mine who lives with his mother in a massive Queenslander overlooking the Brisbane River with Rolls Royces and Range Rovers in the driveway has received tens of thousands of dollars from NDIS for all kinds of bogus work because his mother is in a wheelchair. Anything remotely associated with the upkeep of the house is paid for by my tax dollars. A new pathway and driveway costing tens of thousands paid by the NDIS because he rolls his mum down there once a week, despite the fact he rolled his mum down the old one with no problems for 20 years. Now, according to Glenn, I haven't been able to verify this, but he says new air cons paid by the uh, air conditioning paid by NDIS, fridge, half the roof fixed on the NDIS. All the kinds of things that normal people have to pay for themselves, billed by the taxpayers because his mum is in a wheelchair, and for people who are sitting on several million dollars in assets, arts, cars and savings, it is obscene. Number two example, and this is a personal interaction I had with an old contact or friend from politics when I was flying back to Canberra from Sydney a few weeks ago. Uh, he has a five-year-old son with autism uh, and it can be very challenging for their family. Their son has challenged socialising, looks at the world differently. He says they have a $36,000 annual budget from NDIS for t things like psychologists, speech therapy, that sort of things. Uh, he said, but they only spend only $270 a week, which roughly works out to $14,000 a year. So roughly about half the budget. Now, he doesn't spend the full budget, but uh, he does say it's helping, it's making a difference to the kid. But his perspective was the budget is just too large. They don't need that amount of money. And I'm not sure everyone out there would be as disciplined as him, only spending, say, half the budget they're allowed to. Just quickly, a third example, and this is from another um, reader who emailed me, Carla Ryan. She says, John is an employer. I see and hear constantly about people who are choosing to work three nights a week, sleeping over at an NDIS-funded caring role, where both the carer and cared for person are mostly deep uh, asleep for $2,400 gross, $800 a night, she says, versus a large range of alternative jobs they are priori prioritising this over, including tradie jobs, warehouse jobs, waiting jobs, accountant jobs, all types of jobs. So she says it's having an impact on the broader labour supply to other areas of, of the workforce as well. Just briefly, I wanted to get into the budget purported savings that the, um, the Labor government is, is claiming on the NDIS. So almost like magic, they're saying they're going to save $70 billion on the NDIS over the next decade through a budget assumption that presently has no policies to achieve it all, at all. So they're saying they're going to try and get from 2026 the cost growth in the NDIS down to 8% a year, which is still a very high cost growth for any government program off a very, very large base. 8%, but last year it was running at 23%. So they don't have any policies to get it from the 23% growth to the 8%. Uh, and, and yet they've baked this into the budget long-term projections as well, this $70 billion saving over a decade. And so far, there's only a commitment by federal and state governments to spend actually $10 billion more outside the NDIS to establish a new scheme to treat children with mild autism and development delays. So no policies to get the NDIS under control, only spending more money outside the NDIS to replace things that the NDIS is currently doing that arguably maybe it shouldn't be doing. The question, and I'll give you an answer to, is Bill, is Bill Shorten the minister the person to fix the NDIS? Uh, well, he was the original architect of it in the Gillard government, um, with good intentions, I might add. It's no doubt he's, he's passionate about disability. But uh, look, I've got serious doubts whether he's the person capable of fixing it. 
He likened claims in opposition of cost blowouts under the Liberals as credible as Iraq uh, war weapons of mass destruction claims. Um, now, it's actually turned out that the Liberals' claims on spending blowouts have turned out to be much, much worse than what they were even saying at the time, but Bill was saying at the time they're not even true. Uh, it was his baby. Um, he's going to have to slay his own baby. Can he do that? Um, he's like, frankly, he's been a bit captured by the disability lobby. Now, it is good that we have a powerful advocate for disability, but it's, it has become a very, very, very powerful vested interest, like the superannuation industry, like other industries around Australia too. Now, we do want people strongly advocating for people for disability, but it's almost gotten to the point where this thing is becoming a little bit untouchable. And I think sometimes, a little unfortunately, there is a bit of a scare campaign run when a government or a minister, like the previous coalition minister, Linda Reynolds, wanted to introduce independent assessments. Sometimes you'll find in the media, they will unfortunately scare people with serious disability into thinking that they're going to miss out on funding. And they'll roll out people, <laughs> frankly, in really severe disability situations, in wheelchairs, young children, are making out in the media that these are the people who are going to suffer as well, when I don't think any government on either side of politics is really suggesting we're going to take money off the you know people with serious disabilities. It's the people more at the margin who arguably maybe should be getting other services in the community that we're really talking about. Bill Shorten stopped publishing the NDIS monthly financial statements because they continued to blow out. It was embarrassing the government. We were reporting on it. Then magically, they stopped appearing. And just broader point around all of this, it's a good example where there's just not really a constituency for taxpayers, getting spending under control, fiscal discipline. Uh, I'd say the CIS is, is one of the few rare exceptions in the public discourse and the debate around this, probably the financial review to an extent too in our editorial lines. But um, I think Bill Shorten also is naturally by nature a taxer and spender. He, if you look at the policies he took to the 2019 election, now I would say of the four tax rises he took, some of them were arguable. You could argue the case for them. Some of them you could say that's, that's not unreasonable. And the four things were reducing the capital gains tax discount, a bit of merit in that, negative gearing, a bit more debatable, the franking credit refundability, open to the eye of the beholder, and, and introducing a 30% uh, minimum tax rate on trust distributions, arguable. But I think while you could say, yeah, he could have raised some more revenue from that, debate the merits of those individual measures, if you look what he was actually going to do with the money, he wasn't going to do what Paul Keating would do with it and reduce income tax, say, to a top rate of 39%. He wanted to use that money to spend on other things like dental for everyone, uh, other things in that sort of social services space. So I think that's in his DNA, and I'm just not convinced that uh, he's the minister to fix it. We're going to need really strong discipline from the Treasurer and the Finance Minister. You know, cutting spending on this area or slowing the growth in spending is not popular with the progressive side of politics. They're worried about leaking votes to the Greens. Uh, I'm yet to see evidence that we're going to get this thing under control. Jim Chalmers was at the Financial Review Business Summit this week. He was asked about it. He said he's confident he will. But he just didn't really show any determination or actual explanation of actually how that's going to be achieved. So uh, my concern is we're going to be having the same conversation in a few years. I'd suggest if they really want to get this thing under control, they need a new minister. Um, and there's some really good Labor backbenchers who have got some good, good... You don't have to be an economist. I've got an economics background. It's not a bias towards economics. These are just a couple of suggestions, both PhDs in economics, really interested in public policy, smart people, people like Andrew Charlton, Daniel Molino, uh, on the Labor side of politics. They're the sort of people, I'm sure there's other people in Labor as well, that maybe we should be thinking, we need a new minister to fix this thing. What to do to fix it? Uh, I won't proclaim to be a disability policy expert. I'm going to speak in very high level principles. Martin Hoffman's in the audience here. He used to be the former head of the National, Indi uh, National Disability Insurance Agency. He would understand this space a lot better than me. But just some high level principle. The basic maths of it is we've either got to cut the number of existing or future participants on the scheme and transition people off it to less costly services or reduce the cost per participant, the amount of dollars we spend for each person. That, that's essentially the equation here. 
Um, I do think we need to draw the line and have some eligibility changes for people with less severe uh, disabilities, particularly in that sort of autism and related space. Uh, there can be other investments going in through the health and the school system and the community system as well. One suggestion put to me by someone who, who has worked quite closely in this space is we need a non-diagnosis eligibility criteria to stop the system being gamed and doctor shopping. Because if you just say you can be diagnosed with blah, uh, what happens, the incentive is for doctors, uh, patients, parents, understandably, to get that diagnosis. And maybe we need a more practical sort of test. Things like functional questions, can a child talk? Can they socialise? Can they get dressed? Can they go to school? And the coalition's former independent assessments were sort of designed to do this through tests by a health professional who didn't already know the person, so the independent, isn't their healthcare professional they usually see, and importantly, applies the rules consistently across the population. So it's actually fair. It means if you have that sort of same criteria for everyone, a similar person in a similar situation is going to be getting the same treatment. Whereas at the moment, it does feel like it is open to gaming the system, doctor shopping, probably, arguably, people who are better off have not only the financial resources to do that, but also probably just the wither all the knowledge, the understanding, uh, how to do that. I, I could probably imagine where it's people probably in the lower socioeconomic classes who don't have the time, the knowledge, the resources to do that, who are actually probably missing out relative to their, their better off peers. Um, Bill Shorten wants to crack down on dodgy providers. That's good. But it's really a rounding error in the whole scheme. There's criminal syndicates and everyone making a lot of money out of the NDIS. But in the grand scheme of things, if whenever you create a big government money pot, you're going to get rorters. You're going to get people trying to take advantage of it. It's good to try and cut down on it, but let's not pretend that's the key problem. The key problem is that the broadness of the eligibility for this, there's just not a line being drawn under it. Uh, just to wrap up, if we don't fix the NDIS, but also some of the broader spending problems around aged care, other things in the budget, then spending as a percentage of GDP, I think, is just going to keep rising. Government's going to get bigger. Uh, at the moment, that's being masked because we've got an enormous revenue boom at the moment uh, through taxation. We've got the China commodities terms of trade boom, as Tom said, fossil fuels ironically delivering uh, a lot of money to government coffers. Also, we've got low unemployment at the moment and income tax bracket creep as well. So personal income taxpayers are doing a lot of heavy lifting for the budget as well. We can't sort of rely on this inflated revenue forever. At some point, the tide is going to turn, whether it's in China, whether it's in the economy, if unemployment ticks up. And uh, we can't just rely on personal income tax payers to keep footing this bill. I'd also argue that for those of us in the room who are interested in broader tax reform, that you can't really have tax reform properly until you have spending reform. Uh, Peter Costello's made this point. I think Robert's made a similar point. Um, because if spending is continually getting out of control, you're constantly chasing your tail, having to raise more tax revenue. If you get the spending under control, disciplined, directed into well areas of the economy, then you can think about, OK, what's the most efficient way to be raising the taxes? We probably arguably need to be lowering personal income tax rates and thresholds. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a case maybe for company tax because international capital is mobile, but we do need to be taxing things more like consumption, land, possibly natural resources as well. And, you know, Perite made some slight moves to move towards a land tax in New South Wales, very, very tepid ones, but uh, the, the Minns government has now unwound that. Um, we don't want to keep chasing our tail. It's a vicious cycle. We need to get spending under control because then we can, it allows us to do other things. Just finally, I made this point in my recent column, because if the government doesn't fix the NDIS, they don't have a hope of reforming the tax systems, the aged care systems, the health system, the education system, because frankly, there's not just going to be any money left to do it. So thanks for listening. You mentioned Paul Keating earlier mm. on, and uh, there's no question that there's a big difference between Paul Keating and Bill Shorten. Mm. Keating was your quintessential economic reformer uh, 40 years ago, whereas, as you say, Bill, mm. Bill Shorten's more a tax and spend uh, um, interventionist. Let me run this quote by you. This mm. is quite intriguing. I just dug this up. This was 1986, um, and Paul Keating is uh, talking to the, uh, the Wall Street Journal of all places. Mm. It's May 14, and he says, We must let Australians know truthfully 
and earnestly what sort of international hole Australia is in. Mm. And this, of course, was at the time of the currency crisis and the balance of payments crisis. And he goes on to say, we are done for if the deficit is not dealt with. We will end up being a third rate economy. And he goes on to say, people appreciate the truth and I'm delighted to tell it to them. He says, the days of the magic pudding, or <laughs> magic money tree, are gone in Australia. You can't go on and have a slice and come back and find it isn't diminished. We can't turn our back on growth and go on writing massive welfare mm. checks. Mm. And as you say, he and his finance minister, Peter Walsh, mm. went about making these big cuts. Mm. And there's no one in Canberra talking this language. But no. is that because we don't really have the kind of bipartisan consensus on these issues that we did in the 80s? I think bipartisanship would help. Uh, politics is definitely more polarised these days. Um, the two-party system is more fragmented. You're seeing the, the minor parties' independence having more of an influence. Uh, I think 24-7 media makes it harder, social media. But I think one of the big differences between now and the late 80s, like you mentioned Keating there, was um, we probably had it, I'd say, too good for too long in Australia. Uh, back then there was sort of a crisis. Yes. It sort of forged the minds, that burning platform. And we haven't had that crisis yet. We haven't. And mm. I, I kind of feel like we've sort of gotten fat and happy off the China boom. Yes terms of trade, commodity prices, tax revenue rolling in, uh, that there really hasn't been the urgency to make tougher decisions. And, and frankly, there really hasn't been anyone really to stand up in Canberra and, and bell the cat on this and say, yes, times are good now. Maybe the current situation, reducing living standards, high yes. inflation, you know, productivity waning, that, that is an opportunity to create a new burning platform. It's not quite a crisis at the moment. Uh, but that is an opportunity if you get the right politicians to take advantage we of We carry that. no brief for Bill Shorten, but couldn't you argue that mm. it requires someone on the left side of politics mm. to put in place real spending restraint? Because mm. the coalition's not going to criticise that. Mm. Just as only an anti-communist like mm. Nixon could go to China, mm. only a tax and spend interventionist like Shorten, perhaps he's the only one who can actually reform the problem. How would you yeah. respond to that? I think in theory that's right. I think these things are easier for the Labor side of politics to do because they will get a bit of support from the coalition. I mean, Peter Dutton has said publicly and privately, we are 100% behind you to back getting the NDIS under control. He's actually said that. Uh, he has. Right. Uh, they, he wants to offer bipartisanship because the coalition know it's out of control. They don't want to inherit this down the track. Uh, so there is an opportunity for a left of centre government uh, whether they take the mantle. I think, as I mentioned in my speech, that, that one of the issues for Labor is they're worried about leaking votes to the Greens mm. in those inner city suburbs, uh, including in the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese's own electorate. And and you've got other senior you know, cabinet ministers like Tanya Plibersek in those kind of seats as well. Uh, and as we were discussing before, and I mentioned, I think, at Concilium, yes. there's also been a big structural change in the Labor yes. Party since Kevin Rudd was rolled as Prime Minister. So they introduced the so-called Rudd Rule, mm. which means 50% of the party membership base now elects the Labor leader as opposed to just, a just everyone in the parliamentary party. So the incentive system is now to be more progressive, more left, because the party base naturally is more left of centre than, say, the members of mm. parliament traditionally have been. So the incentive system, if you look at the ministers now, um, Tony Burke, mm -hmm. he's doing the bidding of the unions. Um, Bill Shorten went quite left on tax and spend when he was leader. Albanese's of the left. Even Chris Bowen's got reasonably religious on the climate change <laughs> stuff as well. And so the incentive for these people mm. who are ambitious, they want to be Labor leader one day, they want to be potentially the next Prime Minister. It's not to tack to the centre like yeah. Paul Keating did, it's to go left and progressive to get the party vote based. You uh, rarely hear that analysis, yeah. but it sounds very plausible. Mm. First question, my colleague Simon Cowan, who runs our research program. Simon. Excellent talk. Thanks for that, John. You talked mm. a lot about the economics of the issue. The other side of this, though, is mm. the politics of the issue. Mm. And one of the things that we've seen, and it's been a huge issue for our intergenerational team, mm. is the massive support for bigger government, particularly amongst younger generations. Mm. And that one of the big problems we have here in spending reform is there doesn't seem to be a political constituency for spending reform, only a massive and growing one for spending increases. What would you say to that? I think that's right. I think there is a mindset shift from the younger generations. Um, 
people in their 20s and 30s and even you know coming through the school system now um, they do have a different mindset to people even I'm in my early 40s you know to people like me and, and older uh, so that that is definitely a challenge um, but the one thing I'd point out is it's possible and I've thought this for a little while is that the inflationary environment we start to feel the consequences of more government spending and so it's possible that could be sort of a bit of a calling card to say, OK, but well, and I'm not sure the young people are making that connection now. They came up during COVID where they were used to the government splashing money around even before that and the global financial crisis, arguably, as well. There was a lot of money splashed around. So there has been this sort of mentality that government's got our backs, which is you know a good thing during a crisis, don't get me wrong. But uh, it does sort of seep into the mentality of younger people and the expectations of them, not only from government, but frankly, from their employers in the workplace. Uh, I think it's something we're all grappling with at the moment. How do we actually deal with that? Next question, Dimitri Burstein. Dimitri uh, is a regular contributor to the Australian's opinion page, and he wrote an important paper for us six months ago on liquidating the future fund and spending that on debt relief. Dimitri. Thanks, Tom. Um, my question is a contrarian one, if I may. Yep. Can I posit that some of our fiscal and regulatory profligacy mm. is a consequence of central bank independence? Every time um, government has initiated policy that has threatened economic growth, the central bank has jumped in and cut interest rates to stimulate the economy. You've seen it this week where economic growth has been slowing, there's been no pressure on the government to engage in fiscal or regulatory reform. Mm. The pressure's all been put on the central bank to cut. Mm. Uh, I'll also note that central bank independence happened in 1996, mm. and most of the structural economic reform happened before that. What would you say to central bank independence being a factor in this? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think too much weight clearly has fallen on monetary policy uh, in the last couple of decades. I think Philip Lowe's made that point. I think Ian McFarlane, former governor of the Reserve Bank's made that point. Glenn Stevens, uh, Peter Costello. So I feel like central banks have taken a bit of pressure off the government, but they're also, their legislated objective is inflation and is still trying to get employment going and stuff as well. So the central bankers are in a difficult position because they can't just sit there, sit there with their, high, their hands tied behind their back and say, well, it's up to you, governments. I mean, I think ideally they would put more pressure. I mean, frankly, we did see Phil Lowe speak out quite a bit on needing more structural reform. Um, but I'm also just, I'm trying to understand your point more broadly about why it's central bank independence that has actually caused that, Dimitri. Can you just elaborate? Because the political pressure would then fall back. Ah, so if they weren't independent, the government had more sort of authority over the central bank there'd be more pressure. Price for their decisions. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Well, I think Paul Keating said he had the RBA in his back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not sure Jim Chalmers does though. No, no, no. Yeah. Next question, uh, Peter Chulip, who mm. uh, runs uh, our uh, economics program, but he also uh, does a lot of work on housing affordability. Mm. Peter. Yeah, um, John, can, you've written on housing policy. Mm. Um, and my sense is that the rhetoric coming out of Canberra mm. on, from both sides is very good. They both, yep. both sides are saying that housing affordability is one of our number one economic and social issues mm. and that the problem is supply. Yes. But they're not doing anything at all about it. Yeah. Um, there's just this big gulf between the rhetoric and the policy delivery and I was wondering, yeah. is there any prospect of real action from, camp, from either side? Yes. No, I totally agree with you, Peter. And you would have read my column last week saying we need more than pretend policies to fix the housing sort of affordability and availability problem. Um, I, yeah, on one level, it's encouraging. I think from the for Prime Minister down, we, we, they're actually talk, talking the right language about supply. They're, the Albanese has pushed back against changing negative gearing and things like that. He's t it's t he, he has dangled $3 billion to the state and local governments if they build 1.2 million homes over five years. That seems like it's not going to happen for a whole host of reasons. But you're right, we've got a lot of little fiddly sort of policies like the Housing Australia Fund, um, which is 
going to put a little bit more money into social and affordable housing, but arguably it probably is just going to crowd out investment that would have happened by the private sector anyway. Uh, we've got a co-equity scheme for about 10,000 low-income earners a year to help them get into the market. But they're not fundamentally really shaking it up and really forcing the states and, importantly, the local governments. I mean, I put a suggestion forward in my column. It wasn't my idea, but maybe the feds, if they're really, really serious about this because of the NIMBY politics they've got to overcome with density and sort of desirable suburbs, they should be really offering direct incentives to local governments to hit particular targets because then those local governments could potentially go to their residents and say, well, if you accept higher density, a bit more traffic around, for example, we'll lower your rates. So the feds could sort of help fund a reduction in rates or public infrastructure in the community. So then those residents are actually seeing tangible benefits of the increased supply and density in their households. But I, I totally agree. I actually think also this is such a fundamental economic and social problem that it is one area of government. I think it's worth the feds throwing more money at in a, in a disciplined, controlled way if it's going to get real results because I think it almost pays for themselves uh, if you could get some serious extra supply into the market in inner and middle ring suburbs. The prominent economist uh, Judith Sloan, who's mm. done various events at CIS over the years, and she's written about workplace relations for CIS, mm. she argues that the problem here is high levels of immigration. Mm. That's what's causing the housing affordability crisis. It's got out of control since the pandemic. Uh, I think 500,000 mm. a year. She wants it to come down dramatically to about 100,000 or less. To what extent is immigration a problem for housing affordability? Look, I've got a little bit, I've got some sympathy to what she's saying. I think we'd probably need to be focusing a nation on the quality of the immigration program rather than the quantity so much. Uh, the government's recent reforms are going to start to do that a little bit more rather than just sort of importing a whole lot of lower skilled, lower income sort of immigrants. I mean, we already do a reasonable job of getting higher skilled, higher paid in, but I, I argue we could do that more, even more targeted. Uh, but. At, at, at the same time, uh, I read Judith Collins with interest. I think she's she's um, thought provoking. She's interesting. She's a good economist. Um, but uh, it's really only a problem because we're not getting the supply into the market. Right. If if we had more housing supply, but mm. I understand her argument in the political because most of those immigrants, yeah. John, are coming to Sydney and Melbourne. They're yeah. very congested cities. They are. And she's saying if you cut back on immigration, that'll make it easier. In the short term, it will. Uh, but also immigration. I think over time it brings in younger people who are future taxpayers to fund the average immigrant, earns more money, works for longer, has young children mm. as well. Look, I think both sides of this debate have a bit of a point. I don't think we want an open slather immigration policy, arguably 500,000 over the last year, although it was a catch up after the borders closed, is, is definitely too much. But we, I think we've got to be careful not to sort of mm. slump into this debate about massive cuts to migration as mm -hmm, well, because mm -hmm. that could be damaging to the economy. We've and got to get more housing And supply. that is the CIS line, but I'm mm. just throwing yeah. Judith at you to keep you honest. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Next <laughs> question, Martin. Martin uh, John mentioned Martin before. Martin, question. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, yes, so um, uh, for my sins, I was the Chief Executive of the NDIS for three years, from 2019 to 2022. Uh, change of government, uh, disagreement with Mr. Shorten meant uh, the elected politician usually wins. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just thought I'd add, John, thanks for your speech, uh, talking about a throwback to the reform era. You, of course, I think are a throwback to the great traditions of, uh, of journalism in public policy, so thanks for all that you do. I just thought I'd add a, a brief comment around the fundamental issue in the, the scheme, which is that the scheme is based around providing the reasonable and necessary supports for every person on the scheme. That phrase, reasonable and necessary, is the foundation of it. It is a qualitative and subjective test, and that is the fundamental problem. When I was there, we took a case to the federal court, WRMF versus the NDIA. We lost that case. That was about whether the scheme should fund sex worker provision of services. Uh, and we lost that case. Uh, on a very specific set of circumstances. Mm. But the point was the uh, federal court held that reasonable and necessary uh, is a qualitative and subjective terms and reasonable people can disagree as to what is reasonable and necessary. That makes it fundamentally impossible for an administrative agency to operate the scheme when there is no objective uh, foundation for decision making. 
It is just what is reasonable in the circumstances. And that's what leads to people who are better resourced, getting higher plans, having more capability to, to um, argue in a subjective and qualitative environment. The requirement, therefore, will be for legislative change. There was no chance for the, the Liberal government attempted legislative change uh, would not have got support from the Labor Party to do so. The question now will be, will the Liberal government be able to work with the Labor Party to pass the necessary reform to, to the Act? Um, you can see in the NDIS review that, as Shorten has just done, them very gently heading in the direction of the need for independent assessments, uh, just not being able to use that language um, for obvious reasons. Uh, and so whether that is done, and so I guess my question would be, what's your take on the chances of legislative reform before the next election in, in to, to the NDIS Act? Thanks. Well, I think legislative reform this year before the election is absolutely essential. Um, for all the reasons that I spelled out, but you've just sort of touched on there, Martin, but I'll give you another one too. So that $70 billion of savings figures over the next decade that they've baked into the budget, it kicks in, in from July 2026. Now, when the election's called, Treasury and the Finance Department have to independently verify that the costings in the budget are accurate. They put out this thing called the pre-election fiscal economic outlook. Now, if Labor hasn't legislated or attempted to legislate or actually rolled out policies to get that 8% cost growth target to achieve it, how can Treasury and Finance, in all honesty, sign off on the PFO with the $70 billion worth of savings over the long term? And I'm going to be putting pressure, and I've started it, I've started mentioning it in the columns, but I'm going to keep doing it up to the lead up to the election through this year because if there's no policies to back that 8% cost growth that's baked into the budget, then we have a fundamentally dishonest bar, uh, budget and the budget of charter honesty requires Treasury and Finance to independently sign off on the budget numbers to the best of their honesty and, and capability as well. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a potential big issue that looms later this year, yeah. Next question, James Phillips, who's on our board at CIS. James. Uh, John, thanks for your talk. The, um, Tom uses this image of the magic um, money tree as though it was a, a delusion. But isn't it the case that the magic money tree does exist and it was invented by the Fed Reserve in the USA and that we've been living with it for about 20 years? It's been distorting capitalism, mm. but it's also been distorting incentives in the political system mm. because how can a politician look to the benefit of not being profligate, mm. when the benefit of not being profligate is marginal. Um, is, is that a fair comment and do you see any um, ho hope for a return to uh, more rational interest rates in mm. the short to medium term? Yeah, I think there's some parallels between your questions and Dimitri's questions. And um, like I said to Dimitri, I think too much of the weight has fallen on monetary policy over the years and it has sort of bailed out the politicians. Um, but this, this cycle could potentially be different because while I know there's expectations of rate cuts, you've got, at the moment, you've still got inflation above target, uh, productivity's weak, declining real living standards, real wages are still not really going anywhere, they're pretty stagnating. So while I think in a pre-pandemic low inflation environment, monetary policy could continue to bail us out because there wasn't really any consequences with the inflation, I think now we're in a different re new regime, essentially, not only inflation in the here and now, but there's going to be all these medium term structural inflationary pressures going into the economy. We touched on this at the Financial Review Summit this week, but the things like the green energy transition, that's going to be very expensive, sucking in a lot of resources for capital, equipment, people all at once when the rest of the world's doing it, ageing populations, uh, labour shortages, uh, and also uh, geopolitical fragmentation, less free trade mm. and all that sort of stuff. So I feel like the central banks aren't going to be able to bail out governments as easily because there's going to be some more structural inflationary pressures in the economy. And it actually might put the pressure back on more structural regulatory kind of reform policies. It's just a matter of whether the politicians finally wake up or the community wakes up uh, that this is really the only path forward. Okay, next question. Yes, sir. Yes, um, uh, you've commented about... Uh, uh, um, Sorry, Keating and Walsh. Mm. I think Hawke was a great contributor to actually the economic sure. reform. 
did it with Howard and Costello. They had Nick Minchin, right, who's also a great contributor. I mean, it's finance far, minister. Yes, finance. Yes. That's I. It's the finance minister, treasurer, and the prime minister of the yes. board. I, my two questions are: Is Katie Gallagher actually a mean girl? <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, what do you think of the shadow treasurer and the shadow mi minister of finance at the moment? Yeah, good questions. Uh, I'd like Katie Gallagher, the finance minister, to be a bit meaner when it comes to government spending discipline. Um, they've made some nips and tucks uh, and reprioritisation, reallocation of spending. But for all their talk pre-election about all the waste that Morrison had put in the budget, there hasn't been any sort of material cuts to the so-called waste. So um, the, the one thing I'd say about Katie Gallagher is um, She's a former chief minister of the ACT, um, and this is this is public, so I'll say it here. She does have a daughter with autism, uh, who is not on the NDIS. Uh, she's she's taken a principled decision herself that uh, Katie that she doesn't uh, she doesn't think that they they're in a situation where they don't necessarily need the financial support as much as others, um, but she has been continually when she goes to medical services. I know this offered it, suggested it, directed towards it. And one thing she's noticed as a result of the NDIS becoming all encompassing, a lot of the other services they would have accessed previously have sort of dried up and they've fallen by the wayside. So I think, I think she's personally actually quite committed to it, to reforming it, getting it under control. Uh, is she gonna carry the, the weight in the cabinet room uh, with Jim Chalmers, Anthony Albanese, Bill Shorten? I mean, she's got a big task ahead of her, frankly. Um, to your question on the shadow finance minister and shadow treasurer, I think Angus uh, Taylor, the shadow treasurer, he's got a good understanding of economics. He studied it. Uh, I think he went to Oxford mm -hmm, as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, he, he's, he's got a good grasp of economics. In fact, I think, I, he, I think he topped his year at Sydney University Economics as well. Yes. And so he, uh, to be honest with you, I think he's got a much better grasp of um, economics than he did on energy policy, mm -hmm. frankly. I mean, some of the energy policies that we saw under the previous government were not helpful. Um, like very interventionist. Very too, interventionist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the snowy hydros mm -hmm. turned out to be, a you know, it's gone from $2 billion to $12 billion. That was more Turnbull than him, though, correct? Uh, it was a Turnbull thing. It was a Turnbull project, but I think Angus was the energy minister, or he inherited it at least. Yes, mm -hmm. it might have been Josh originally from memory. Uh, and then the shadow finance minister. I'm actually just trying. <laughs> to think. Who is that? I'm trying uh, to think too. Who uh, is it? Oh, Jane. Sorry. Jane no, Hume. No, yeah. sorry. No yeah. disrespect to Jane. I know Jane well and, and speak to her regularly. Sorry, it's just a mental blank. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. Jane's Jane's excellent, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, she's sort of come out of that sort of financial services world. Um, I think the thing from opposition is that it's difficult to, you're never going to see them arguing for major wholesale reforms or major spending cuts here, there. And um, it's sort of, they'll sort of complain and whinge about a few things, but I don't think they're going to be making a big song and dance, for example, about the NDIS. But I think they're telling the government and signalling the government, if you do something, we're prepared to back it. The spectre of Tony Abbott's first budget haunts the coalition. Definitely. And yeah. I mean, Tony Abbott's first budget, in my eyes, there was not much wrong with it. Mm. I mean, we're talking about a $7, I think, co-payment to go to the GP, ironic, and a few other sort of cuts to spending that were never going to be able to be affordable anyway. It wasn't actually cutting it in absolute terms. It was just reducing the growth in it that Labor had baked into the budget. Ironically, the only thing that lasted from that first 2014 budget from Hockey and Abbott was the the deficit repair levy, which was, a, I think, a two percentage point income tax increase for a, increase temporarily for a couple of years. Two more questions. Uh, Richard Beattie, long time CIS supporter, and then we'll go to Jeremy Sammet from the Financial Review. Richard. A uh, quick one. I'd like to follow up on uh, uh, Dimitri's and James's comment about the Reserve Bank and competition. Mm. And what I'm remembering was, I think it was 1942, income tax powers went mm. from the States to the Commonwealth. Mm by taking away that competition between the states, which we most mm. remember Joe exercising to have lower costs in mm. Queensland and got people like Virgin up there and the like, isn't that the sort of fundamental change that needs to be made? Bring the competition back. Mm. Yeah, competition on income, uh, on tax more generally between states, I, I think there's pros and cons, frankly. Um, yes, it can be helpful in terms of trying to you know compete to get business investment and, and things like that and so 
you do get a lowering. But the, 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 the trouble is, on the flip side of it, you can get an erosion of very efficient tax bases that actually we should be using. And so, for example, when, and people might have different view in this room, when Joe got rid of um, the death tax or the inheritance tax, um, everyone else had to follow suit. Now, a lot of economists would argue, actually, an inheritance tax or a death tax is a highly efficient tax and we'd be much better be using that more than, say, an income tax which saps incentive to work, all that sort of stuff as well. So I think the, the risk on competition between the states is actually you get a bit of a race to the bottom and then as a country we're not necessarily better off overall. Next question, Jeremy Sammet. Uh, John, we just had Penny Wong double down on the government's language of Australia facing the most dangerous strategic environment since mm. World War II. We've had the bipartisan support for AUKUS. We've had the Defence Strategic Review about talking mm. about spending more on defence. Is it right that there was no new money in last year's budget for defence? And if that, that doesn't happen, mm. if that happens again this year, that that will also be a question of budget integrity. And isn't the whole question of needing to spend more on defence the whole missing element to the whole budget discussion as well? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question, Jeremy. I mean, I think a lot of the defence spending that we've talked about with AUKUS, like the 300-odd billion, is actually baked in over decades and decades. It's very long term. And as a percentage of GDP, there's not really a, a big ramp up in defence spending projected. I think it's projected to go up a little bit. Um, now, I'm not a defence policy expert. I mean, some of, some people would argue that we need to spend a lot more on defence to protect ourselves. Maybe we can't rely on the US alliance as much as we might have hoped in the past. Uh, the one counter I'd say to all of that and is, as an economist, sometimes the defence spending, the cost blowouts, they really kind of escape any scrutiny, actually. It's sort of put in this basket of, oh, if you question spending on defence or a cost blowout, oh, you're against national security. And unfortunately, that's the sort of... So it's almost like off-limits. Not to say we should actually have absolute spending reductions, but there's no reason why we shouldn't be scrutinising individual programs and saying, is that good value for money? Was that well done by the Defence Department? Could we have done better? Um, but I suspect over time we're probably going to be spending more on defence than we have been in the past. Yeah. And on that note, it's a good way to conclude things. I mean, the spending programs, as we've heard today, are out of control, NDIS... Uh, the Gonski Schools Program. Mm. Which Glenn's done some great work Glenn on. Glenn Fay, our, mm. our head of our, our education program, has done some wonderful work mm. on that. And he was quoted at great length by Chris Mitchell in The Australian. Yeah. Uh, as he's as he's a role model for an econo uh, education advisor. Yeah, could I just say, just yep. on that, Glenn yep. has done some great work in that area, changing the nature of the public Good. debate about not always having to tip more money into a program because it doesn't necessarily deliver results. You've got to get the structure of the systems right. And Peter, to Absolutely. his credit too, yes. on the land supply housing density, yes. he's really changed the national debate too. So well, well John, thank you very yeah. much for doing my no, job. You're having you're no, you're no. <laughs> It's been really nice. But you're I having think, an impact. No, yeah. I would say this, but this yeah. is also why think tanks, public policy research organisations, play a very important role <laughs> in the public debate. So thanks for that tip to our education <laughs> and housing programs. But also, look, uh, NDIS, uh, Gonski mm. Schools, you mentioned public hospitals, aged child care, care yeah. aged care, mm. defence, as Jeremy mentioned, but also the interest on debt. Mm. I mean, it's all good when we've got the resources boom. Mm. But what happens when that revenue boom comes to an end? Where's yeah. that money? And this is why we're here talking to John, because unfortunately, with rare exceptions, you've got CIS and financial reviews, editorials, and John's outstanding columns. This message is very rarely heard. You won't hear this at the Sydney Morning Herald or The Guardian or the ABC. Uh, and I think it's important that we had you here today. And I'm very grateful that you could all be here so early in the morning to hear John. In my judgment, John is the best economics writer in the country. And we're thrilled to have you. So thank you very much, John. Thanks. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. For decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice working hard to promote sound liberal principles. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel, then click the notification bell. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our classical liberal cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved. <laughs>